Well, hey everybody. Uh, my name is Jamie. I'm the lead pastor here at Lighthouse and I'm so glad that you are here with us today wherever you are watching from, whether it's at home with your family, whether you're on a break at work, uh, on public transport, heading to work, or wherever it is that you're going. It's uh, so good to see you and so good to have you connected with us, Church Online today. And if you've been tracking with us over the last couple of weeks, you'll know that uh, we actually kicked off a brand new series last week called Love Dates and Heartbreaks. This is a series that we are doing on relationships. It is um, a series that I hope will uh, bless you and encourage you and help strengthen you in your relationships. Now, <clears throat> the funny thing is about relationships is everyone has an opinion and what a relationship would look like. And there's nothing uh, more controversial or more opinionated than the social media app, Twitter. Um, I have a Twitter account and I enjoy it. Uh, sometimes it can be quite controversial, sometimes it can be quite funny. Uh, and this week I, I was looking at some of the kind of funnier perspectives on relationships according to Twitter. Here's the first one. Um, this guy, Daniel Carrillo says, marriage is just texting each other do we need anything from the grocery store a bunch of times until day until one day one of you dies? Okay, very sad. What was this next one? 90% of marriage is just shouting, what? From other rooms. Some of you can relate right now. Come on, tell the truth. Or this uh, guy says, at least 10% of divorces can be avoided if we just buy bigger Blankets. Come on, one of you is that person who rolls over in the middle of the night and steals the blanket from the other person. You know exactly what I'm talking about. How about this next one? Um, let's get married and have kids. So instead of enjoying coffee in the morning, you can braid hair while I pack lunches and we can all be late. Or here's my favorite one. Wife, why are you braiding like that? Ah, marriage. When you can be questioned for continuing to live. Come on, somebody. Some funny examples of what relationships and, of course, marriage can be like. The funniest one I heard of this week was a story of an elderly couple who one day were out for a walk in a park. And uh, the husband was kind of feeling remorseful for some of the ways he had treated his wife over the years. Um, seeing uh, some flowers, he picks one, she sits down on the bench, she extends it to him. And, she, and he asked her the question, darling, how is it after all these years of me mistreating you and losing my temper and losing my cool and saying some things, you know, my foul temper, my foul mouth, how is it that you remained so calm? She pauses, she smiles, she says, well, whenever we'd end up in that kind of crazy cycle, I would just go and clean the toilet. To which he said, well, how does cleaning a toilet, how does it help you stay calm when I was losing control? To which she responded, because I cleaned the toilet with your toothbrush. There you go. So you want to have a long, successful marriage, maybe consider changing the utensil you use for cleaning toilets. Well, joking aside, you know, we really value relationships. We think that God created relationships with a purpose. And this series, again, that we're doing, this is not just for single people. If you're a single person, you're moving towards a relationship, or maybe you're dating already and you're in a relationship, this series is for you. If you're someone who's uh, in, high, in, in, in secondary school or you're thinking about going to college or maybe a college student and you're trying to figure out this part of your life, this series is for you. If you're a married person, newly married, been married a long time, this series is for you. If you've been separated or maybe divorced, divorced or maybe even widowed, moving out of a relationship and even maybe thinking about entering back into a relationship, this series is for you. This series is for all of us. Why? Because it isn't just about our romantic relationships. This series is about, about all relationships. And the reason why we're doing this is because <clears throat> pastorally speaking, one of the things that breaks my heart is when I watch people make relationship decisions that undermine their relationships. And it happens all the time. Even this week, I was on two, maybe even three phone calls helping some people with, with this exact issue where they're constantly making decisions that undermine their relationships. Relationship. But again, this is this is driven by two cultural myths, two cultural um, kind of propositions, two cultural presuppositions. Is probably a better word um, that kind of drive this. The first myth, of course, last week we looked at is the right person myth. And the right person myth basically says once you meet the right person, everything 
will be all right. Once, just once I find that right person, everything will be all right. Or the second myth we looked at last week, of course, was the promise myth. And the promise myth basically says a promise replaces the need for preparation. All we need is a kiss and a promise. All we need is, is a promise and a parting. These two myths, we see it replayed over and over and over again in our novels, in our music, in our movies. And without noticing it, I mean, now that I'm talking about it, you can see it for what it is, but subconsciously it acts as a filter through which we see the world, to which we see each other. And these two myth, myths actually can, in a very large way, in a very powerful way, and often a very damaging way, shape how we do relationships. But we know, and here's the kind of underlying premise of last week's message, that promises are no substitute for preparation. Why? Because you don't promise to win. Remember last week's analogy? Sport teams don't go into locker rooms and promise to win. They prepare. They practice. They're disciplined. You don't promise to win. You prepare to win. This is true of your career. This is true of your academia. This is true of anything you do. And I want you to see, friend, this this is true of your relationships. This is why following Jesus is worthwhile because Jesus not only makes our lives better when we surrender our lives to him, not only will he heal us, not only will he save us and redeem us and give us a plan and a purpose and all those wonderful things, but Jesus also makes us better at life, predominantly and primarily in our relationships. Jesus helps us to become the kind of person you're looking for is looking for. We're so consumed, we're trying to find the right person that we're not really thinking about what it means to become the right person. And Jesus, by the help of the Holy Spirit, will help us to become the kind of person you're looking for is looking for. And the question we asked last week was, are you the person or are you becoming the person that you're looking for is looking for. And if you're married, let me frame it differently. Are you still the person they were looking for? And in John's gospel, chapter 15, verse 12, Jesus kind of clarified what how he makes our lives better because not only has he shown us his love and not only can that love as we experience it change us, transform us, heal us, grow us, save us. But this love uh, where he says, love each other, as I, as I have loved you, this, this love in John 15, 12, we see is not only a love that makes our lives better, but as we experience and as we allow it to permeate through our lives, it also makes us better at life. Jesus raised the standard. Jesus basically said the conclusion, the climax of all the commandments is this one new command, love each other as I have loved you. You. And this is the premise for the entire series that we're building off of looking at what does it mean? What does it look like practically? Jesus defined the fruit that we, that we produce by being connected to, to the Father as being love. This week, we're going to define what that fruit is. So the message I've called this week is the fine print. Not the fine print that catches you out, but the fine print that makes you better. The fine print that will make you a fine thing. Come on, we're all either looking for a fine thing or looking to be a fine thing or looking to get back to being a fine thing. This week we're gonna look at how the fine print really makes us a fine thing. We're gonna look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse one to 13. Again, if you're watching, have your phone handy and you wanna track along with me in today's notes, simply download the Bible app by version. click on more, click on events, click on Lighthouse Church and all of my notes. So everything I'm gonna talk about and some things I won't be able to talk about will be in the notes for you. Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, chapter 13, excuse me, Verse 1 to 13, the Apostle Paul writes this letter, 1 Corinthians a letter to a church in a city called Corinth, which is, of course, in modern day Greece. And in verse 4, he begins to define what this love is. And, and I want to say something to you, it's kind of technical, but it's, it's revolutionary as it comes to your reading, especially Paul's writing in the New Testament. <clears throat> Paul very often gave instructions, gave directives, he gave commands. Another way of saying it is, he gave imperatives. But Paul's imperatives are actually applications of Jesus' one command. When Paul says we, for, we should forgive, 
just as God has forgiven us. When Paul says we should serve just as, oftentimes, in fact, all the time, he points, his imperatives point back to, there should be applications of what Jesus has commanded us. And today, as we break down 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 and 5 today, next week we'll finish off the chapter we're going to see what it looks like to fulfill the, Jesus' command to love one another just as he has loved us. So it begins with verse 4. Love, we're told, is patient. Love is patient. Meaning, love is not pushy. If, if, if you're being pushy, you're not being loving. Love doesn't push. Love doesn't rush. Love doesn't pressure. Love chooses to move at the other person's pace. Love powers down. Love doesn't condemn to call someone up. Love powers down. Love, in essence, is a decision to pause. A decision to pause rather than push. Because we have a choice, don't we? We have a choice in our relationships. We have a choice to to push that person. And again, if you're in the dating phase... This can be about boundaries. Love is a choice not to push someone beyond their boundaries, not to push someone beyond where they are comfortable. Love is a decision to pause. Love is a decision to come down to their level. Love is a decision to be patient, not be pushy. Maybe applying it to a marriage context, love is also understanding that you know, a perf- there's only one perfect person and he is Jesus. And although we want our marriage to grow and develop and we want the people that we're married to to grow and develop, love does not cause that growth by means of pushing. Love causes that growth by means of pausing. And I understand, right? I understand the tension here. This is not natural, right? It's not natural. Why? Because we all move at our own pace. What's natural to us is our pace. What's, what's, what's expected of us is our desire. Our pace, your pace is natural to you. Okay, but the other person's pace is not. And so any relationship that we're in where there's two types of paces, there's going to be tension. What the Apostle Paul is saying as he applies Jesus' command to our lives is that love in essence defers. Love understands that it it can go faster. It can go further. It can go higher, but it doesn't. It defers. It accommodates the other person's capacity, which is really important. Why? Patience accommodates the other person's capacity. And this, of course, is what God has done for us. God accommodates to our capacity. God doesn't come down and beat us over the head with a hammer, as some of us were raised to believe in our religious upbringing. God is not always angry with us. God isn't this kind of disinterested, um, passive-aggressive parent whom we can never find uh, a, a means or a reason to please him. God loves us. God loves you. And God came into our world and he accommodated himself to our capacity. He could have come in all of his glorious splendor. He could have, he could have just pressed reset on the whole world, but instead he came in a manger as a baby. Why? Because we understand this. That's our capacity. God reveals himself to us in ways that we can comprehend. Love defers. Love is patient. Love is not pushy. Love presses pause. Love protects other people's boundaries by not pushing them beyond them. Next thing we see love is, is love is also kind. Love is kind. Now, again, when you first read this, especially speaking to all the men out there today, you know, kindness is kind of perceived uh, in a masculine perspective as kind of being weak. We perceive kindness so often as being weakness. To be kind is to be weak because we've all grown up in a very real world where depending on our our upbringing, depending on how we were treated, our family of origin, the estate or area we grew up in, the town we grew up in, the country we grew up in, very often, kindness is appreciated, but kindness is also manipulated. And because of our past kindness, we may have some negative experiences of where that kindness was, yes, appreciated, but manipulated. We've kind of come to learn that kindness ultimately is weakness. But that, my friend, even though, again, it's a cultural norm, perhaps for you, that is not true. In fact, 
Unkindness is weakness. Unkindness is weakness. Why? Because kindness, again, is powering down to the other person's level. If you can't show kindness, it's because you can't bridle your strength. If you can't show kindness, it's because you're not able to control yourself to a point where you can show that kindness. Therefore, by not being able to do something, flip it on its head, kindness is not weakness, unkindness is weakness. The, uh, the inability to be kind is actually a weakness. Not just that, but furthermore, kindness is actually strength. Kindness is actually strength. Why? Because kindness in essence, if I can define it, is loaning someone. It's loaning. It's, it's, kindness is giving. Kindness is extending our strength rather than reminding them of their weakness. This is so true. It's not just a guy thing. This is for all the gals out there too, for all you ladies, for all you married ladies. Kindness is not just is, is not um, just strength for guys. Kindness is strength for all of us. Kindness is loaning our strength rather than constantly and consistently reminding them of their weakness. It is so easy. It is so much more natural. Come on, isn't it? To remind the person of where they're wrong, why they're wrong, and how they're wrong again. What's not natural, what's unnatural, what's hard, what requires strength is to say, in this moment, I am going to loan you my strength. I'm going to be strong for you when you're weak so that you can become strong. So I'm, when I'm weak, you can loan me your strength. It's working together as, uh, uh, as, a, as a couple to be strong. In essence, kindness is love's response to weakness. Kindness is love's response to weakness. Why? Because kindness in essence, is doing for others what they cannot in the moment do for themselves. Kindness is not enabling um, bad behavior, but kindness is doing for others what they cannot do in the moment for themselves, whether it's because they don't have the ability in terms of maturity, they don't have the ability in terms of emotional stability. Whatever it is they're going through, kindness is stepping into that gap rather than pulling them down and pointing out all their flaws. Kindness is doing for others what they cannot do for themselves in their weakness. And again, this is crucial. Why? Because this is what God has done for us. God showed you kindness when we were broken, when we were far from God, when we were full of sin, when we couldn't help ourselves, God showed us kindness. And not only did he show us kindness, God continues daily to show us kindness. It's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance, it says in the book of Romans. God's kindness is what ultimately uh, opened up the possibility of our salvation. This is what God has done for us. Now a question we've got to ask ourselves which is really crucial in terms of applying this truth to us, is what is your go-to response to weakness? When you see weakness in your relationship, whether you're dating, whether it's with a sibling, a parent, a child, a friend, in the context of your marriage, what is your go-to response in terms of weakness? Because your go-to response when you're confronted with, with the weakness of the person that you love or care for reveals a lot about yourself. This is crucial. And again, if you're someone who's dating, Pay close attention to this. Pay close attention to this. Why? Because their response to the weakness of others will eventually become their response to the weakness in you. I'll say it again. Their response to the weakness of others will eventually become their response to the weakness of you. People who often use kindness as a means to an end often become mean in the end. If you're someone who's dating right now and the person you're dating isn't kind, just doesn't have the capacity to be kind, sees kindness as a weakness, you need to pay close attention because this is dangerous. They might use it now because when we're dating, right, we only want to show the best version of ourselves. <clears throat> we're always on our best behavior when we're dating, right? And then all of a sudden we put a ring on it, everything changes. Pay close attention to this. Ask yourself the question, uh, is the person I'm dating a kind person and, and actually apply it in its truest sense to yourself, not just in terms of who you're looking for, but who you're becoming? Am I a kind person? Would I marry someone like me? And if not, you know, don't beat yourself up too much, but take the challenge and allow God to change your heart. Love is patient. Love is kind. Thirdly, we're told that love also does not envy. Love does not boast. 
Love is not proud, does not envy, does not boast, and is not proud. In essence, what the Apostle Paul is saying is that love allows the other person to shine. Love is comfortable with the abilities and the strengths and the giftings of the other person. Love celebrates the victories of other people. Love is not threatened by, by the other person's success. Love is not threatened by when the other person does well. Love, love is able to stay backstage cheering on the other person as they have their moment in the spot. And this is so crucial because we see this all the time worked out in relationships in terms of how we speak to each other. Because here's the truth. If you don't feel good about yourself, it's really hard to let others feel good about themselves. If you don't feel good about yourself, if you're struggling with your own sense of worth, identity and value, if you're not, if you're not allowing God to um, address those areas and those needs in your life, if you haven't come to the point of surrendering your life to Jesus and align, aligning your perspective of you with his perspective of you, then what that means in terms of your relationships is it's very hard to let other people have that sense of security. And so when they have their spotlight, when they're being cheered, when people are celebrating them or bragging on them, rather than joining in and being the chief celebrant, the chief bragger of, of the person that we love, we feel threatened by it. And so we begin to cut it down. Again, this is what Jesus did for us. Jesus, when he came to the world, he is God in flesh, God incarnate, God, Latin, incarnate, flesh. Jesus came, God, intra world, in the flesh. He is God. He could have snapped his finger. You think Thanos is impressive? Let me tell you something. Jesus makes Thanos look like, like a joke. The power and ability Jesus had within him every moment that we read in the Gospels, yet he was able to bridle his strength and be patient with humanity. He showed tremendous kindness, not just to people who were broken and sinful, but even people who did not like him. I mean, think about how he even treated people who mocked him as he was dying. But most importantly, Jesus did not use the God card. He didn't feel the need to walk into a restaurant and be like, Jesus is here. I want that seat. You get out of here. That's my space. Jesus didn't feel the need to flaunt his ability, to flaunt his identity. Jesus was secure knowing whose he was and who he was. And he calls us to follow in his example. He calls us to follow him. <clears throat> You know, it's so interesting that in the Gospels, Jesus doesn't call us to pray to him. Jesus doesn't call us um, to, to, to um, necessarily worship him. Jesus calls us over and over and over again to follow him. Because in following him, we communicate, we pray to him. In following him, we acknowledge him, we worship him. In following him, we become like him. Because Jesus not only makes our lives better, but Jesus makes us better at Life And Jesus was able to step out of the spotlight. Jesus was able to uh, allow himself to go through all the things he went through for our sake, for our benefit, so that we could shine. Pay close attention to your internal reaction to the success of the people closest to you. Husbands, you should be the chief celebrant of your spouse. You should be the one who's commenting on how, how great she is. You should be the one who's finding reasons to, to love and appreciate and celebrate. You're the one that should be sending flowers and cards. Your love should be greater and more evident than anyone else's love. Yes, family come along and say things and do things, but husbands, you should not be threatened by, by, by your wife's success, whether it's in her career or her field or her creativity. You should be her greatest cheerleader. Similarly, wives, don't be the person who, and I see this all the time in Ireland, who, you know, maybe your husband does something, he, he helps out a neighbor or he does some feat of, of, of kindness and everyone's complimenting him. But rather than joining in the cores and being the chief uh, complimenter of your husband, you pull him down. Why? Because you don't want him to get notions. You don't want him to get notions. You don't want him growing ahead. You don't want him to get him beyond himself. Understand life does a great job on beating people up and keeping people down. We don't need to beat each other down. We need to lift each other up. Pay close attention to the internal reactions that we feel to the success of people close to you. This is huge. Love is patient. Love is kind. Does not envy. 
does not boast, is not proud. And fourthly, love does not dishonor. And this could, this is so huge. This could be a whole message in and of itself. Love, by definition, does not dishonor. In other words, love does not behave disgracefully. Love does not behave indecently. Love does not behave dishonorably. Another way of saying it is this. Love doesn't create regret. Love doesn't create regret. Speaking to all the young men and young women watching right now, those of you who are in college or after college or working or in secondary school and you're entering into this phase of discovering relationships and figure out you know, what it means to be an adult in society. Let me tell you something. True love doesn't create regret. True love, as we've seen, is patient. True love is kind. True love is comfortable with the other person getting the limelight, even when we don't. But ultimately, love does not create regret. Young guys, love makes choices that ultimately will cause her to look back and rejoice, not regret. Girls, gals, in terms of, of how you treat him and how you try, try to get out of him what you need, you want him to look back at how your relationship started and how it flourished and rejoice and not regret. Love doesn't, recre- doesn't create regret. Honor, honor is, think about this. Honor is, as defined in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, honor is in humility. And again, I, I've, I've done so many messages on this. Humility isn't putting ourselves down. Humility isn't beating ourselves up. Humility isn't playing the poor me card. Humility is lifting others up. Humility isn't putting yourself down. It's lifting others up. In humility, value others above yourself. doesn't mean they are more valuable than you or you have less value than them. It's simply saying honor is the act, the decision of the will, an attitude where we lift people up as if they were more valuable than ourselves. Why? Because this is what God in Christ Jesus has done for you. We're told that God so loved the world that he gave his son Jesus. When God gave Jesus, he spared no expense. And when he sent Jesus into the world and allowed him to die, Jesus didn't just die for dying. It's like Jesus, it was a divine exchange. Kind of like a prisoner exchange. Jesus died in our place so we could live in his place. God showed us incredible kindness and patience and all these things. But God honored us by allowing us to be, to, to, Jesus to value us even above himself. And again, let's get practical. Let's, let's shift some gears for a second. You know, you know how to do this, right? You know how to honor people. You're thinking, how do I know? Let me give you an example. Imagine you have the opportunity to have coffee or dinner with your favorite actor or your favorite actress or your favorite recording artist or whoever it is, sports person, VIP. Imagine you have the opportunity to go to dinner with your favorite uh, VIP. Think about how you would prepare for that meeting. Think about how Night after night, you would go over in your mind, what am I going to say? How am I going to look? Where am I going to sit? You know, think about all the preparation that would go into that meeting. Think about how you would behave at that meeting. Think about the things, the mental notes that you would make, things that you would do and things that you wouldn't do. Think about how you would behave in that context. Ultimately, you would do what we all would do. You would be the best version of yourself. You would, you would focus on being the best version of you. You would make sure so that all your flaws and all the things about you that you know, are challenging, you, you wouldn't allow any of those to come to that table. You would be the best version of you. Not only that, but you would defer. If, I mean, you would be early. And if they were late, I mean, it's like, yo, Kanye, what's up, man? And he's like, sorry, I'm late. You're like, well, I've been waiting. You'd be like, oh, it's no problem, Kanye. Oh, no issue. I mean, you would, you would defer. You would be patient with them. You would be kind 
to them. And everything that you do, say and ask, you would be honorable towards them. You know how to honor each other. You know what honor looks like in terms of our preparation. You know what honor looks like in terms of attitude. You know what honor looks like in terms of behavior. You know what honor looks like in terms of being patient, being kind, and how to speak in a way that lifts the other person up and shows them more value than pull them down. Again, this is exactly how our Heavenly Father wants us to love others. Not just others, the whole world, that's true, but this is exactly how our Heavenly Father wants us in the context of relationships to love each other. So the question is, what would it look like if we loved one another honorably? What would it look like if we, in humility, valued the other person above ourselves? What would it look like if we deferred and we prepared and we behaved in a way that said and demonstrated to the other person they're valuable? Maybe they're not a famous rock star or football star or music star, but they are your star. They're the person you chose. Like we said last week, the right person isn't the right person because they're right. They're right because they're right for you because you choose them. They're your star. What would it look like if you loved them honorably? Now, we're going to kind of bring this thing to a close in a second. But let me just kind of say this. Controversy alert. I want to say something that's highly controversial, okay? And I don't usually do this, but, but I, I strongly believe in this. And so I'm going to say it, okay? And I'm just hoping that your collective maturity, understanding my heart and the context of this message, you won't misinterpret it. But when it comes to honor, I want to say this really, really clearly. Don't stay in a relationship where you are continually dishonored. Don't stay in a relationship where you continually are dishonored. When we help people who are um, going through the trauma of domestic abuse, we often think of domestic abuse as violence. But we would say to a person who is continually getting beat up by their spouse, whether it's the husband beat the wife, or the wife beat the husband, doesn't really matter. The problem isn't male or female. The problem is abuse. Okay, it's really important. We would say to them, whatever you do for your own safety and well-being, do not go back. And yet, for some reason, our culture, it's, it's not okay to physically abuse someone, but it is okay to verbally berate, pull down, and destroy someone's soul. I want to tell you as a pastor, do not stay in a relationship where you are continually dishonored. Now, again, don't misinterpret me. I'm not saying this is your jail-free card to get out of a relationship where you know you're not pulling your weight and you should be doing more to make that relationship better, okay? It's not a cop-out. But for those who are genuinely are suffering the abuse of being continually dishonored, don't stay in that relationship. And let me give you some advice for daters. If you're dating and you're in a relationship where you're not even married, you're not even engaged, but you're already being continually abused, you have my permission to break up now. I mean, whip out your phone, Text them and say, or text them and say, we're done. Because if this is how the relationship starts, can you imagine how it will end? You do not want to pay that price and you are worth too much to stay in that relationship. Why? Here's the kind of, here's what the pastoral crux that breaks my heart. Because if you allow yourself to stay in a relationship where you're continually being dishonored, eventually you'll begin to think, I am dishonorable. The, the environment you're in will become your identity. If you're continually in a relationship where you're being dishonored, you will think I am dishonorable and then you'll begin to behave dishonorably because it's become your identity. You've accepted this is who I am. And then you will say and think and do things that will not only destroy you and your relationship with your heavenly father, but ultimately will destroy the people that you love and he loves too. This is so destructive. That's why I'm so strong in it. Think about this for a second as you think about yourself. We know in commercial terms, at the value of a thing, okay, the value, the worth of a thing is determined by the price of a thing. If you go into a, into a supermarket, a, a Tesco or a super value, or you go into a, you know, a, a sports clothing store, or you go online to eBay or Amazon, the value of something is determined by the price of something, meaning the, the more expensive it is, the more valuable it is, right? Very basic commerce 101. Well, think about this. Your heavenly father paid the highest price for you. 
He emptied heaven. He bankrupted the coffers of heaven. He sent his best, his one and only son into this world to take on the sin and the shame and the guilt and the brokenness and the failures of your life to die in your place so that he who was sinless became sin for we who are sinful so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we who are dead in sin can live by the power of the resurrection life of Jesus Christ. Think about the price that the Father God paid for you. Think about his love for you. Think about how much worth you have in his eyes. Think about how he expresses this love to you. And then ask the question, what does that say about your value? Your value. Maybe you don't have an earthly father or mother who treated you with value. Your heavenly father loves you. And in his eyes, you have immense value worth. You are important. You are special to him. Don't allow yourself to be continually dishonored. Don't allow yourself to believe that your identity is dishonorable and don't behave dishonorably. Don't allow yourself to be dishonored. But more importantly, don't allow yourself to dishonor others. Don't allow yourself to dishonor others. Here's my advice for daters on this. You can completely ignore this advice. <clears throat> it's a free country. You're welcome to do so. It's your life. And you can go out and be like, well, I'm going to be impatient. I'm going to be unkind. I'm going to be dishonorable. I'm going to go out and I'm going to be these things. While looking for someone who is patient, kind, and honorable. But here's the truth. They won't be looking for you. They won't be looking for you. Last night I watched a, a movie with my wife, uh, The Lady in the Tramp, the remake of the old uh, classic. And of course in it, this lady dog finds a street dog and he's a tramp and there's this wonderful romantic portrayal of you know, how love transcends uh, social boundaries and classes and there's a lot of good stuff in there. The truth is, however, very often the lady does not marry the tramp, okay? The truth is that's not how it works because people who are being patient, people who are working on their kindness, people who are, who are, I don't know, people who are becoming the kind of person they're looking for is looking for are not looking for you. They're looking for someone like them. And deep down, this is what you want too, right? You want, you want to be that person and you want to be that person. This is how you prepare if you're dating. This is how you stay prepared if you're married. This is how you become the person worth looking for if you're dating. This is how you become the person worth staying for if you're married. The truth is most people thought when they got this marriage deal, that their partner would be so perfect that they wouldn't require patience. And I can hear all the married people laughing all over the place. This, But it's true. We all kind of thought naively and innocently, oh, when I marry them, they're going to be so perfect that I, don't, I won't need to be patient. I won't need to be kind. Like because of who they are and how good they are, it'll just come out. And then we get, we get you know, we move from boyfriend, girlfriend to engagement to marriage. And all of a sudden things change and, that's the case and we, we, we find we don't have enough patience. We don't have enough kindness. There's not enough honor in us to be able to help them. And it can get very negative very quickly. But here is the good news. And there's good news. The good news is marriage can be something that we enjoy. Marriage can be something not just we endure but enjoy. Marriage can be something that, that not just thrives, but not just survives but thrives. Marriage can make us better people. Marriage can make us into a better person as we receive God's love for us and our identity. Our desires are transformed that love and we extend that love by being kind and patient and honorable to the people around us. As we deal with our selfishness, marriage can make us better people and marriage can make our relationship better. But the key is to understand that who you are now matters. Why? Because who you are now is who you're becoming next. The best predictor, and again, speaking to young people right now, those who are moving towards single people, those who are moving towards relationships, who you are now is the best predictor of who you are becoming next. If you want to be that, for, if you want to become that person in the future, be that person now. If, if you're looking for that person in the future, rather than putting all the energy and looking for them and trying to fool that kind of person to looking to you, work on you. Allow God to work with you and work on you so you can be the person you're looking for, is looking for, and you can stay as a married person, a person worth staying for. Next week, 
We'll continue 1 Corinthians 13. We'll finish the chapter. The message is called Grown Up Love. But for this week, I want to challenge you all to two things. Read the whole chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. You can do it online, the Bible app, wherever. If you have a Bible in your home, read it and pray. And again, there's no right or wrong way here. Just read it and pray. Heavenly Father, help me to love so-and-so or my future so-and-so in a way that is kind, in a way that is, is, is patient, in a way that is honorable, and so on and so forth. And I want, to, I want to encourage you that I believe that as we engage with this, as we engage with God's word, as we engage with the Father of God through the Holy Spirit, I believe God is going to do something in us and through us to make our relationships not just things that we endure, but things that we enjoy, healthy, vibrant, life-giving relationships that, of course, will be a blessing to us and a blessing to those around us. Lastly, before I pray, if this content's been helpful, I want to encourage you, help us get the word out. Uh, at the end of this uh, broadcast today, just like this content, sh- comment on it, share it, send it, send it to a friend. Help us help people. People need this stuff, this content. Help us get the word out this week by sharing it with your world. Amen? Let's pray. So Father, I thank you today that God, first and foremostly, you were kind to us. <clears throat> you were and are patient with us. And even when we were living dishonorably, even when we were in our identity dishonorable, when we were doing things and saying things that we know fall short of your will for our lives, still, God, you treated us in a way that made us valuable, that made us have worth. That when you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, By doing so, he showed us, he demonstrated how much you love and value us. God, I pray, help our relationships, the ones that are and the ones that will be. Help us not just to look to you, help us to follow you. Lord, I pray, make our lives better, but make us better at life. That we all could have relationships, friendships, marriages, that wouldn't be just things that we endure but could be things that we enjoy. We thank you, Lord, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.